Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host, Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect, and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Please enjoy the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project where our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We've got a great guest with us today and that's Michael Tanner. Michael is the founder of an organisation called Credible Leaders and he sets his work about helping leaders to become leaders that other people will willingly follow anywhere and I think that's a wonderful mission and a wonderful vision on which he's on. He's had a very diverse career, starting out in the military, and we'll talk a little bit about that, leading through some engineering and software engineering roles, through to when he has created this organization called Credible Leaders, and helping people to measure and improve their leadership. He's also the host of a podcast called Rookie Leaders, and I've been listening to that podcast over the last few days. It's a wonderful program, and if you're looking for more diversity of thought and some more lessons about leadership, I do encourage you to go and give that a listen and and give Michael a a rating and a, and a review. I'm sure that he'd greatly appreciate that. Anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael now, and Michael, I'll get you to introduce yourself a bit further with the audience. Tell us a little bit more about that interesting and diverse background that you've had and what led you to be with us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Mick. It is, uh, it's a real honor to be a part of the, the Leadership Project, uh, your podcast here. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Uh, so yeah, let me tell you a little bit about me. So uh, I tell folks that uh, my first professional leadership position was about 28 years ago in 1993. That's the first position uh, where I was in leadership and actually got paid to be in leadership. And that was actually in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, And so that was my first experience in leadership was in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, And, you know, in when I teach leadership these days and and people understand that I'm coming from that military background, they anticipate that I'm going to be talking about command and control, that I'm going to be talking about authority and rank structure and an organizational chart or something like that. But, but really I wouldn't have called it servant leadership back in the Marine Corps because I wouldn't have known those terms, but the best leadership that I experienced and the leadership actually that I learned in the United States Marine Corps was really a servant leadership based training. Uh, Yes, rank is important and so forth, but uh, it was really those leaders that used a servant leadership model that became the leaders that, as you were saying earlier, that would influence people willingly. People would willingly follow those in, those leaders, not because they outranked them, but because they understood that those leaders were, you know, had the best interest of the team at heart and things like that. So uh, that's where I first learned leadership. And, and I carried that into the corporate world as I, as I got out of the military, uh, I have a computer science background, so I, I got into uh, uh, software development pretty quickly and got into leadership roles there. And um, my my uh, passion as I was in the software development world was I wanted a bigger problem to solve for the company for which I work. And those problems got big enough that I needed a team to lead. And it was at that time that really my passion shifted from solving a big problem with software to seeing a team win and solve a big problem. And so that's when leadership really became a big passion of mine. And uh, I just became that person that I wanted to see a group of people, a team, I wanted to see them succeed. And I knew I was passionate about leadership when that became, uh, you know, my intention was just to see other people win 
And so that's one of the reasons that I developed the the uh, or started the uh, Credible Leadership Group was just so that on a on a larger scale, I could teach individuals how to properly lead and see their team and of course themselves win at whatever they're they're after. That's great, Michael, and thank you for that background. I I certainly want to unpack a number of things that you've just said, uh, and I'll start with this element around the Marine Corps or military in general, and I think you are right. There is a perception of what military leadership looks like, and there's almost a stereotype that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. As with all stereotypes, you will find pockets where that is true, but you will also find pockets where that is not true. You brought up the term servant leadership. When you say servant leadership, what does that mean to you? Well, so for me, Mick, that, that kind of, it's rooted in my working definition of leadership in general. Okay. Um, you probably experienced this a lot as well. If you ask 10 people, what is the definition of leadership? Well, they're going to come up with 10 different definitions. And if you Google leadership definition or whatever, you're going to come up with lots of different definitions. Well, I feel the need to define a, a very concise and clear definition of leadership. Uh, and, and it's this, influencing others towards a shared goal. And I'll break that down quickly, but it'll, you'll see in my definition there, you'll see servant leadership. Uh, but influencing others towards a shared goal, that's the definition I use to build all of my leadership development upon. And so to break that down, uh, first of all, there has have to be others involved, right? You're, you're not in leadership if other people aren't involved in following you. Um, there has to be a goal. Right. We, we as a group of people or as a team, we're not just wandering aimlessly through the wilderness. We have a purpose. We have an intention. We have something that we want to accomplish. And, and that is our goal. And then I start the definition with the word influencing. And I use that word very carefully because influencing someone, it carries with it this idea of a willingness to follow. Right. So if I'm able to influence someone to do a task, then they're not doing it because I outrank them or because I'm the boss. They're not doing it out of an obligation or or even a fear because I could punish them in some way or I could even fire them or something like that. They're doing it willingly. They want to do that thing that I've asked them to do uh, because of the influence that that I, as their leader, have in, in on them and in their life and so forth. But then lastly, the word shared. So we're We're influencing others towards a shared goal. Well, the word shared in my definition has two parts. Uh, First of all, it's shared in the sense that it's communicated, right? A goal is useless if the leader hasn't communicated that goal. If you haven't communicated clearly and often uh, the, the goal that we as a team are trying to achieve. So that's the first part of the word shared in my definition. But the second part of that word shared in, in my definition is this idea of togetherness. And it's this idea of we are in this together, right? So we as a team, we have a goal. And even though I'm the leader, I'm sharing in the achievement of that goal. And so I, as the leader, I'm not sitting in my office just barking out commands or orders and expecting all the other team members to go and do all the work to achieve that goal. No, I'm in it with you, right? So this shared is this idea of we are in this together in the accomplishment of this goal. And I think, especially there, influencing the word influence and as as well as that second part of the word shared, to me, that defines servant leadership, right? Servant leadership is that I'm in this with you. And in fact, my purpose as a leader is to serve you, the team member, to make sure that any kind of obstacles or challenges or struggles that you have in the achievement of that goal My job is to overcome those for you, to remove those for you, to serve you in any way necessary to help you to accomplish that goal. And it's that shared aspect of my definition. We're in this together. Yeah, nice one, Michael. Let's unpack that a little bit further as well. So firstly, I'll say that we have a common philosophy maybe some slightly different words, but with a similar meaning. So my definition of leadership is someone that inspires people into action because they wanted to do that. 
and right. inspires them into action around a common purpose. So we have very similar uh, philosophies, slightly different language, but that's, sure. that's, that's fine, of course. And of course, great leaders, hopefully the common purpose that they're driving towards has meaningful impact on the world and, and a nice purpose and, and, uh, and an impact and meaning for people that they're trying to serve. On the servant leadership part, it, you really made me think of something that I learned during an a interview with a bunch of people from Google and their approach around servant leadership once you have that common purpose and everyone has their North Star that they're following, the leader's role is to then ask really three questions. What are you working on today? How can I help you? And are if there are any roadblocks in your way that I can help you remove? What's your reflection to that in terms of your view? Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think as a leader... One of the most important questions you can consistently ask your team members is, how can I help you, right? Um, Yes, as leaders, we've got to be clear on the vision. We've got to be clear on, uh, you know, casting that vision and energizing and inspiring our team. Uh, Oftentimes we need, you know, extra effort. We need kind of heroic efforts to achieve our goals. And so it's important that as leaders that we cast that vision and energize our teams that way. But in, in what I call the messy middle, right? So you've cast the vision. You've got everybody all energized about accomplishing the goal. But then when you get to work and it gets hard, you're now in the messy middle. And it, it, instead of casting vision as a leader now, you're there shoulder to shoulder with your team. And you're asking them, what can I do, right? How can I help you? And, and sometimes that is, taking care of something that they can't do at all, right? They, they don't have the authority to do, or they're not equipped to do, or they don't have the skill set to do it or something like that. Other times, it's just that they're overwhelmed with the activity that they need to be doing, and they just need someone else to do it with them, to help them do what it is that they're doing. Uh, and so I think I'm, I'm a firm believer of that on, on a daily basis. You're in the trenches with your team and asking that question, how can I help you is, is a super powerful, uh, you know, question that you can lead with. I'd like to just expand on that and then say that providing that psychologically safe environment where they feel comfortable to stick up their hand and ask for help when they do need it and to show them that asking for help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness and that you're there for them and you have their back. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. You, you, you really have to be careful with that. You have to, as a leader, recognize that not everyone feels safety in saying, I need this kind of help, right? They, they, many of them certainly don't feel uh, safe in being proactive to, you know, raise their hand and say, hey, I need your help here. But even when you're asking the question, hey, how can I help you today? There are some team members that you may have that they don't feel comfortable telling you that they need your help because in, in their mind, to some degree, that means that they've failed in some way or they're insufficient in some way. If they, especially if they need help from their leader, then in some way they're insufficient. And I'll tell you, as a leader, the way that you overcome that is through relationship. Uh, I often talk about that leadership is really about relationship. And if you can build good, solid relationships with your team members, that's going to open them up to the point that they can. Uh, feel safe and secure in in acknowledging the help that they do need. And honestly, that's the place as a leader, that's the place that you want them in because otherwise they're going to kind of suffer in silence, right? They're going to, uh, they're going to fail in, in deliverables or in, you know, in uh, milestones or in timelines or something like that. And they're going to fail in that way, having not asked for the help that you or other team members are oftentimes very capable and also very willing to provide. So building those relationships with each individual team member is super important to give them that that safety and security in their mind to acknowledge that they need help of yours or anyone else's for that matter. Yeah, a thousand percent, Michael. And it's a hundred percent or a thousand percent to do with how you relate to other people 
And one That's of the right. things that you said there was the individual relationships. Absolutely. Fully agree there. Yes. want to potentially challenge something you said before, but let's just okay. explore it for a second. You said that leadership is about other people, which I fully agree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to then challenge this concept of the position of leader as opposed to being a leader. Mm, yeah. So we're heavily influenced by Simon Sinek. I think uh, anyone that listens to the show would already have heard that. And he's very famous right. for saying leadership is not a rank. That's it's a, right. It's a responsibility. It's that ability to inspire people into action. It's not necessarily a job title. Any reflections on that? No, I, I completely agree with that. And, and, you know, in my definition of leadership, influencing others towards a shared goal, I don't put in that definition any sense of authority or rank or organizational structure whatsoever. I think we've probably all been a part of a group of people, been a part of a team where someone had the position or someone had the title of leader in that group of people or in that team. And it wasn't spoken, but everyone recognized that there was a different member of the team who had no title whatsoever, but that's the person that had all the influence over all of the other team members, right? So they didn't have a title, they didn't have a position, but because of their their competence, because of maybe their their credibility, their history of success, or, or everyone just really respects them and so forth. And, and when that individual, you know, gives a suggestion or says the team should do this or then the team members are influenced by that. And and they, they follow that recommendation from that person that does not have the title, even though there is a person that does have the title. And sometimes maybe you've even seen where those two individuals, the direction they're giving, if you will, it contradicts. And what you'll see is that individuals on that team they will still follow that individual that doesn't have the title instead of the one that does. Uh, and so y- you can certainly be a leader without having any kind of title or any kind of rank or authority um, or anything like that. I-, I firmly believe that. Yeah, well said, Michael. And I challenge everyone listening at home, just pause now and look around your teams and your organization. And I think within a, a very short number of seconds, you'll be able to think of the type of people that Michael is talking about. Let's circle back to the Marine Corps now and that mm-hmm. stereotype. I've got a few questions to ask here. So that one of the stereotypes that gets spoken about with military leadership styles is the concept of instinctive obedience. What is your view about whether there is a time and a place for that or whether there is no place for that in a modern world? Yeah, so when, you, when it comes to the military and this idea of people are just going to instinctively obey your command because you outrank them, I don't deny the fact that there is some truth to that, right? But realize that in, the, especially because this is a military context. When, when it's a serious situation, I, I'll just use an example. So I listened to an interview one time with a, a tank commander, a U.S. Army tank commander, and he was in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, and one of his statements was, when you're inside of a tank and you're taking fire and you tell one of your the people inside the tank to get out of the tank to fix the track, while you're under fire, that individual is not going to do that just because you outrank them. That individual is going to be willing to do that if they've been trained well and treated well. That, those were his words, you know, some 85, 90 year old man at this point. But he was saying that when that individual has been trained well and treated well, and he went on to elaborate that if, you, if you're not treating your people well, then they deserve to disobey you. They deserve the right to disobey you if you're not treating them well. Now, this is an army officer in three wars. And he said, basically, if you're not treating your people well, they deserve the right to disobey you and not follow you just because you outrank them. And I believe that is true in the corporate world as well. 
I acknowledge that sometimes because the CEO says to do something that people just do it because he said so. But as that CEO, you have to recognize that if people are following you just because of your title or position, I think at best, you're getting a half-hearted effort from them. If they're following you because they have this opinion of you that they would follow you anywhere, they were willing to do anything for you. Now you know you're getting the very best out of them. You're no longer leading from title or position. You're leading from relationship at that point. And so, yeah, I, I believe it exists, but it's certainly not the optimal way to lead. Mm, yeah, fully agree. And I think uh, underlying message in what you've just been saying is also the word trust as well. So treating people well, treating people with consistency, et cetera, right. will build trust. And if you maintain that trust, they will follow you anywhere. But once you start right. er eroding that trust, then you've got some problems. All right, let's dig a little bit further on the Marine Corps topic. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast the last few days, as I mentioned, and one of the things that you do bring up is about the 14 leadership traits. Mm -hmm. I think if we went into that, we would be talking for many hours, but could, can, you, yes. could you summarize just in, in a few kind of sentences about what, is the, what are the 14 leadership traits that the Marine Corps instill in their people? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. And, and um, what I did on the podcast, I did a, a series of podcasts where I covered each of the leadership traits uh, over the course of like 14 weeks or so or 15 weeks. Um, but we learn these leadership traits from day one. I mean, the moment you arrive at a Marine Corps boot camp, you start to learn these leadership traits. And they are, luckily, we have an acronym for them. It is JJ Did Tie Buckle. Uh, and I'll try to remember all 14 off the top of my head here with that acronym, but it's a uh, uh, judgment, justice, tact, uh, initiative, enthusiasm, bearing, unselfishness, courage, knowledge, loyalty, and endurance. Um, those are the 14 leadership traits. And then in my in my uh, series on the podcast, I had to add a fifth, 15th one that uh, I feel is missing from the 14 Marine Corps leadership trait. And that is the, the trait of humility. Um, I know it would upset the, um, the acronym there, but I believe humility is super important in, in mm -hmm. leadership as well. That was what I wanted to unpack. That was the episode that really caught my attention. So right. humility is not something that um, always resonates with the term leadership, but I think it is mm -hmm. super important. What does humility mean to you? Well, I think, I think humility is important. I think it's missing from the leadership traits and all, because especially since I've gotten into the corporate world, I, I saw it in the military world, didn't recognize it but at the time, but I've certainly seen it in the corporate world. I believe one of the biggest, one of the main downfalls of leadership is ego. Uh, you know, people, they get the title or they get the position or, or the, they feel like they now have the prestige and so forth, the authority, and they allow ego to, to uh, dismantle their, their leadership, their influence over those that they're leading. And I, and the antidote, if you will, in my opinion, to ego is humility, to, to have a humble spirit about yourself in leading. Um, I believe there's a misconception in leadership that when you're the leader, you have to now have all the answers. You have to have all of the best ideas. You have to, you know, you're, you just go into the team and you say, team, here's the problem and here's how we're going to fix it. And that's, that's not the right way to lead, in my opinion. The, the right way to lead is with a humble spirit where you go into the team and you say, team, here is the problem. I would love to understand what you all believe is the best idea to solve that problem. Now they may come up with the, the same idea that you had and so forth, but going in, in that humble spirit of, I want to hear from you, the team members on how is best to solve this problem. That's a much better leadership philosophy to humble yourself that way, because here's what happens. You as an individual, it's impossible that you always have the best idea. 
But when you solicit multiple ideas from your team members, then it's much more likely, statistically, it's more likely that you're going to get the best, you're going to land on the best idea. But here's the the power in leading humbly this way. When your team members come up with the idea, it's their idea, they're already bought in. They're all in. They're wholeheartedly going to put forth the effort necessary to make that idea successful. If you come in with your ego as a leader and say, here's the problem, here's how we're going to fix it. If they disagree with how to fix it in any way, again, you're going to get a half-hearted effort from them at best. But if you lead humbly, now you've gotten their feedback, they're committed, they're bought into that because it was their idea. And, and again, ego tells us, as well, I want to take credit for that leader. That, uh, as a leader, I want to take credit for that idea. That, would be, that is the wrong approach to leadership uh, because, uh, I mean, in the worst case, you'll get sabotage from the team members trying to destroy your idea rather than being fully bought into it because it was their idea. And ultimately, if the team wins, guess what? You as the leader, you win also. There's so many things there, Michael, that we have to agree with. Once again, a thousand percent. It's all about learning to be the last to speak, right? So giving people a space where they do feel that they, their ideas are valued, that they matter, that, that you're going to listen to them and you're going to listen to them with uh, an open mind and be mindful and listen to them without judgment so that they can put forward ideas. And the idea of building more ideation through that, the idea of building that ownership so that they take personal responsibility and accountability for the result because they own it. And yeah, if you take credit for it, there's nothing more demoralizing. I think everyone can think of that in the audience. Times where you've seen People take credit for other people's work. There's nothing more demoralizing than that. And you even use the word sabotage at that point. Yeah, really, really interesting. Yeah, you know, I always tell leaders, this needs to be your philosophy. You all, as the leader, you always take blame, but give credit. Always give credit. Don't ever take any of the credit. The credit is always the team. If there's something wrong, the blame is yours. It's not their fault. It's your fault as the leader. If you have that approach, you'll certainly avoid what you're talking about, that demoralizing your team because you as the leader are taking credit. I'll tell you another mistake that I see a lot, Michael, coming back to that last to speak element. And I have to admit, I think I've even done this several times and it's something that I try not to do, but you do fall into this trap. You walk into a room and go, okay, team, we've got this problem. Um, Here's my idea how to fix it, but I want to know what you think. Yes, yeah, too late. Too late. <laughs> too late. Exactly. They're just going to reflect back to you and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you, your idea was good, right? So, exactly. Exactly. You even have to be careful with things like body language in these sessions. So when, when people are sharing their ideas, try not to be overt in your body language, reaction, facial expressions, et cetera, because people are always looking to you for a steer about what makes you happy and what pleases you. So you try to be as neutral as possible as long as possible. That's right. No, I totally agree with that. And, and you know, where I get caught up in that, uh, Mick, is I, I'm typically not a patient person, right? And if the and typically when we as a team, when we have a problem, it's typically pretty urgent, right? And so that just heightens my impatience when there's a problem and it's urgent. And so my tendency is to want to go into the team because I think I've got the best idea. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. Let's get after it, right? Uh, and so it's it's patience that is the most difficult for me to to sit and wait on four or five or ten people to to uh, offer up their idea and then have some healthy debate on which is the and I get impatient with all of that and, and I want to just kind of rush in and say here let's do it this way. Uh, but ultimately, again, if if I can be patient and be humble in that situation. Uh, then uh, I can be assured we're going we're gonna to come away with the best idea to solve the problem, even if it was the same idea I had in, originally. But we're going to have the, the, the right idea to solve the problem, and that team's going to be fully bought in and committed to solving at that yeah, point. Great. Excellent. Let's wind the clock forward now to credible leaders and your organization now. And I've been studying a little bit about what you do, and 
I've seen that you've got a interesting approach to measuring leadership. Tell us more about why you think it's important to measure leadership and, and how you go about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's um, as, as I started Incredible Leaders, uh, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to help individuals as well as teams and companies measure leadership, but then also improve leadership. So I always say we do two things. We measure leadership and we improve leadership. And one of the reasons that I believe it's so important to measure leadership is because, first of all, in order to measure something, you have to have it clearly identified what it is. You know, and we talked about earlier, ask 10 people what leadership is and you'll get 10 different answers. Google it and it's just all over the map. And I want to help organizations crisply and cleanly define leadership so that they can then measure it. Right. And so uh, I, I don't care if, so, if, a, if a team or a person settles on my definition of leadership, I just want to help them come away with a definition that is really, really clear to them on what leadership is. And then I want to help them measure leadership. And so what we've discovered, if you will, as we started investigating that and asking people, well, how do you measure leadership? We discovered that I believe a, a lot of people are measuring leadership the wrong way. The, the, the majority of the, the responses that we will get to the question, how do you measure leadership? The majority of those answers are related to attrition. So they'll talk about, you know, if we have a high percentage of attrition in our team, then we know our leadership is struggling. Well, my challenge to that is, if that's your metric, it's too late. It's almost like looking at the scoreboard at the end of a sporting event, at the end of a game. Well, the game's over. You can't change the score now. And so if you're looking at attrition, for instance, and you have a high level of attrition, well, you've already lost the best performers probably in your team. And so at that point, it's kind of too late to measure leadership. And so what we're trying to do is equip individuals to measure leadership real time. Right now, how effective is my leadership? Because I don't want individuals or teams using those metrics like attrition. Uh, and and I, see, uh, I see others use like a percentage of goals met. Well, again, if, if you didn't meet the goal, it, it's too late. If at the end of the year, you didn't meet your revenue goal, it's too late. I want to measure that now so that I can see if I'm going to meet that goal at the end of the year. And so that's what we're trying to do with leadership, enable people to, uh, to measure it right now and then take the action necessary to actually see that measurement or that score, see it improve. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And if I play off that a little bit, people do improve what they measure, right? So if they know that they're going to be measured on something, that's what they will focus on for sure. Right. And with the other examples that you spoke about with different type of goal attainments, et cetera, they may find out other ways of achieving that goal that are maybe not the ways that you want them to. So it is interesting. And then I think anything that increases someone's awareness of where their strengths are so that they can build on those strengths and awareness of where their shortcomings are so that they can either work with those shortcomings, improve those shortcomings or, or deal with them in other ways, you know, having people around them that help them cover their blind spots, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that mm -hmm. heightens awareness is, is certainly worthwhile. In the measuring leadership approach that you've got, you came up with a formula around mm -hmm. that. So can you share that with the audience? Yeah. You know, you, you touched on something just there that, that um, really highlights my feeling around the need for a formula or what we call the leadership equation. And that is that when we're measuring leadership, I want to, as much as possible, make it a, an objective measurement, right? Because people are more willing to accept an objective measurement and then do the action necessary to improve that measurement. If, if that measurement is in some way, it's related to emotions or feelings, if it's subjective in some way, then you know, people tend to hold up their defenses to it, not accept it as, as readily, and certainly aren't 
uh, as willing to do the hard work necessary to make it better, to improve it. But when a measurement is objective, and in my opinion, nothing gets more objective than math, right? Um, I used to say when I was in school that math was my favorite subject because in most cases, there's only one correct answer. Right. When you were in your English class or your literature class and you were writing your opinion on a poem or something like that, well, your opinion on the poem may differ from the professor's opinion on the, uh, of the poem. And, and so there's that subjectivity. But in math, there's one answer. There's one right answer. And so that was the reason that I really felt compelled to let's build a formula, a leadership equation, as we call it, that will give individuals a score right? A a, a number. And then we can work on the components of that equation or the variables of that equation. And we can see that number rise. And, you know, again, it's an objective score. It's a number. But then because I can see that number rise, well, now I get the energy. I get the motivation behind that around. Well, I want to increase my number even higher and higher and higher. Uh, And so that was the reason that we uh, developed this leadership equation and me just being a math nerd, I, I felt the need for a, a, a leadership equation, but it has four variables in it. And those four variables are, and we'll dive into any of these or all of these, if you like, but those four variables are credibility, competence, your motive reasons for being a leader. And then lastly, leadership. And then I've put those together in a mathematical equation that gives those four components a different uh, weight, if you will, because uh, each of those four components have a differing impact to your leadership effectiveness. Mm. All right. Thanks, Michael. We will uh, delve into that one. Just a quick uh, correction you said at the end. You said leadership uh, in your formula was relationship. I think it was just a uh, a slip. Ah, yes, <laughs> it's a relationship. Yeah, no no yes, problems, but leadership. it was Sorry. just a slip. It's okay. We we know that you know what your 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 question is. Um, the um, interesting thing here that I want to delve into is about self awareness. How are you using the tool? I, I played with it myself earlier today, and I I did find it kind of interesting. And I do believe that I am quite self aware. But that's me answering the question. Do, do you also use it in any kind of 360 approach where the person's boss and their, their team might also respond on the leader's behalf? Yeah, no, that's a very good point, Mick. And, and yeah, so with that leadership equation, we've built what we call the leadership calculator, and it's basically a questionnaire. Uh, and then it applies your responses to the, you know, to those questions into the equation and it spits out for you a, a number. Uh, and you are exactly correct. It, and, and I say it this way, I, it sounds harsh, but I say it this way. My perception of my leadership doesn't matter at all. What matters is the team that I lead, those individuals, their perception of my leadership. That's what really matters. And so we do allow uh, individuals to Use the leadership calculator on their own behalf, just so that you can see it, you can experience it and so forth. But just recognize we tend to have uh, an overinflated perception of ourselves. Uh, and so the real power in the leadership calculator is to send it to your team members, your peers, your boss, you know, your leaders and so forth. Send it to other people. Uh, And and after someone takes the leadership calculator and gets their own score, that's when they're given the opportunity to send it to other people. And those others, they can be your team members, they can be your boss, they can be your peers, whatever. Uh, They will take that very, very similar assessment. They will take it anonymously. That way, you know, you're getting candid uh, feedback from them. But then you get back a very similar report, but it's much more valuable to you because now it's the perception of those that you're leading, not your own. Yeah. A thousand percent. Leadership is all about other people, right? And it's not about whether whether your result resonates with you. It's it's whether your leadership resonates with others. What would be really interesting from what I just said, Michael, is then to compare and let's say across the different categories that you've got in your calculator, 
let's say that I score myself as, oh, yeah, I always do this. And the team go, really, Mick, do you? And they, <laughs> right, and, and they right. score somewhere else. Blind spot. And it might help you to identify where you think that you're knocking it out of the park and the rest of the team are not so sure. That could be really, not, not just to get the team to report, but to compare their report on you to your report on you to test that self-perception. Yeah, you know, in, in some of my leadership training, uh, building out that scoreboard is exactly uh, what we do with, with our clients, right? So we have, we have a, um, a scoreboard where you will place on that scoreboard your perception of your leadership, and then you will plot on that scoreboard everyone else's perception of you, right? So as those individual results come in, you won't know who they are, again, because they're anonymous, but you're going to plot on that scoreboard where those team members scored you. Uh, and one, it's eye-opening to see, hey, you know, here I was up here, but everybody else kind of sees me down here. Uh, but then that collectively really gives you a clear roadmap as to what areas of the leadership equation do you really need to be focused on? Um, that, that view of the scoreboard that we develop with individuals it can, for instance, pinpoint, hey, you really need to be working on your relationship. You know, people believe in your competence and your history, your credibility, but they don't feel like they can relate to you. They don't know you well enough to be able to relate to you. So you really need to be working on your relationship and building out that scoreboard with the results from all those other individuals really helps an individual pinpoint wh where the biggest bang for their buck is, if you will, related to what you should focus on in the leadership equation. Yeah, I can definitely see how that would be really powerful, Michael. The other thing that we're talking about here, you, you made a very interesting comment before about then moving the needle and improving. And one of the things I want to say to the people at home is, unlike IQ, things like leadership and your EQ is something that you can work on and you can improve it over, the, over time if you know where you need to work on it. What's your reflection on that? Uh, no, I totally agree with that. I, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that leadership is learned. We're not born leaders. Uh, now, I, I recognize that some people have natural characteristics that may make leadership easier. Uh, so, for instance, I believe that leadership is probably easier for an extrovert than it is an introvert. But I definitely believe that uh, that leadership is something that is learned, that it can be improved. Um, you have to take the, you know, the necessary action and do the necessary work to improve your leadership effectiveness. But it is definitely something that you can learn and that you can improve. And, and I believe anyone can be a great leader. Great. OK, let's let's go into the four parameters that you have in your uh, quotient or your equation here. So let's start with credibility. Why does credibility rate so highly in your in your calculator? Well, well, I don't want to nerd out on the math too much, but let me and I know everybody can't see the equation on the podcast here, but let me let me kind of first just describe the math that's in the equation and then we'll we'll pick apart each each component. But first of all, we have credibility and competence. And those two are added together. Um, credibility is is your track record or your history of some type of success, right? Uh, this is at what level does your team believe that you can lead them to success? And that is added to competence. Um, and competence is, you know, it's that knowledge, that skill set that is necessary uh, to get the team to success. And those two are added together, okay? Now, that sum is then divided by your motive or your reason for being a leader. Why do you want to be a leader? Um, and it is a divisor because if your team questions your motives, if they believe that your motives are selfish in nature, then that's going to dramatically decrease your leadership effectiveness, right? So if they think that you're making a decision uh, because you want to promote yourself, right? So if you're that ego-driven leader, and you come in there, here's the problem, and here's how we're going to fix it. They're questioning your motives at a high level there, and that's going to greatly reduce your leadership effectiveness. But then finally, that whole sum, that you know, credibility added to competence, 
that divided by motive, that whole thing is now multiplied by relationship. And it's multiplied by relationship because a high level of relationship with an individual can overcome shortcomings in a lot of those other variables, right? So for instance, if I ask a person on my team to do something and I know that it's a task no one likes to do or something like that, and I ask this person to do that task, they may initially question my motive. Well, why is he asking me to do that? But then their their mind is going to quickly, but I have a really, really good relationship with Mick and I know he's got my best interests at heart, right? And so you can see how relationship just overcame that questioning of the motive. And it'll do the same for credibility or competence or whatever, right? If, um, if you're leading into something new, you don't necessarily have a track record. You don't have a, tr- a, a credibility associated with leading your team into that thing. But again, because you have a good relationship with those individuals, they'll say to themselves, well, I know he's got the best interest of the team at heart. And I know he's going to work hard with us. And, and it'll overcome that lack of credibility. So that's the whole equation. Now we can dive into each and every one of those components if you'd like. Yeah, I'd like to just maybe pick on a few of them. So listening to what you said about relationship there, I think that comes down to know, like, and trust. If they know, like, and trust you, that can overcome some of the others, particularly as you go into new territory, as you mentioned. The other one I want to throw to you and see what you think is, and we already used this word earlier in the podcast. And I want to bring it up again now. And that's the word perception. And I want to pick on motive here for a second and just hear your thoughts on this. It's not actually whether you have an ulterior motive or not. It's the perception of whether you have an ulterior motive. So you could have the purest motive in the world. But if your team perceive that you have some other motive, it is really going to damage your ability to influence and, and inspire them. Your reflections on that? Yeah. When, when I talk about motive, and, and especially as we talk about perception of your motive, it's really your, your actions that drive the perception of your team. Uh, because here's the reality. Your team can't read your mind. And so they don't know what your true motives for wanting to be a leader are. Now, now I acknowledge some people, they are in leadership for selfish reasons. They want the prestige, they want the title, they want the compensation, whatever it might be, right? I would argue that that if you're going to lead that way, your leadership is not going to be all that effective. But then there are other leaders that are in leadership for truly pure motives. They want to see people win. They want to positively impact people's lives. They want to deliver good business results and so forth, right? So they're in it for really pure reason. That's their 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 mental approach to leadership, but their actions don't show that to the team. So for instance, that ego-driven leader that just comes in and says, hey, here's the problem, here's the solution, let's go do it. Earlier, we talked about the leader that takes credit for the success of the team and so forth. Those are actions that shows your team that you have a selfish motive. Even if you don't have a selfish motive, when you take credit for the team's success, you've just taken the action. You've just demonstrated to them that you have a selfish motive. And the next decision you make after that, they will question your motive. Oh, well, is he making that decision again so that he can stand up in front of the board and take credit for all that we do? Right. So it's your actions that give them that perception, not your, you know, your thought process. Thanks, Michael, for sharing that. And now get a good understanding of your equation that you've come up with. You've then extrapolated that into five levels of leadership. Can you describe those for our audience, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, one of the things that I felt necessary, and again, I'm a math nerd, and so I understand the math behind the leadership equation. But one of the things that I was worried about is that people would get a number from that, and they would want to compare that to an academic scale, you know, zero to 100. And and, um, and the math is just not going to give you a good clean number like that. And so I felt the need to, to interpret that number 
and and it relates a little bit to the scoreboard that I was talking about earlier, but it's going to put each individual on one of five levels of of leadership, if you will. And you can just kind of view a a, a set of stairs, you know, that's moving upwards. Uh, And I've defined those, those five levels. And then the score that you get from the equation is going to put you in one of those scores. And again, it, when, once you plot the results from everyone, then you'll be able to see really clearly which level are you on. But I've defined five levels that then get mapped in this scoreboard for you. Uh, and the first level is manager. And this is where really you're leading with title, right? You don't have the history behind you of success, maybe. This is that person maybe that has uh, just been uh, promoted, if you will, from team member to now team leader. And really, the influence that you have over your team on the manager level is your title, is your position. But you move up from there and you move up into uh, what we call the achiever level. So now you're, now you're starting to build up that history. You're starting to build up that credibility. You have a few successes under your belt as a leader. Uh, and people are starting to, to see and believe that you can lead them to further success. So you're starting to achieve that success. And then in our third level, you get into what we call the transformer level. And what that is, is now you're starting to transform some of the the members of your team. For the first time, maybe some of your team members are starting to consider leadership for themselves. And that's because your influence over them, right? You, you, you being their leader has started to transform them into thinking, well, I want to be a leader also, right? Mm-hmm. And then finally, and then fourthly, you, you get into the influencer level. Uh, and this is where, th- this is almost that utopia that everyone, uh, every leader desires where your team members would say of you, I would follow him anywhere, right? So again, this ties back to my definition of leadership greatly in that, this is where you get to that point where people are willingly following you, right? Mm-hmm. This is where and you've probably seen this in your corporate world before, where you have a leader leading a team and maybe they leave and go to another company. The leader leaves and goes to another company, or maybe they go to another department or another division within the company. And before you know it, three or four or more of those team members that used to report to that person, they go over to that team as well. And, and it's because they, they have such that influence over them that I would follow that person anywhere. And then lastly, at the very top, the, the, the fifth level that we have is the multiplier. And basically what that is, is as a leader, you're multiplying yourself. You're creating other very influential leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, they, people are now leaving your team but they're leaving your team to be another influential leader of another team, just like you. are. And so those are the five levels and, and the equation is going to put you on one of those five levels and then give you insight into, well, what do I need to do to go to the next level? Mm. Something that you said there really rings true with something I saw on your website and something that is very relevant to the leadership project. And that was, leaders developing other leaders and I can see that at that level five level that you're talking about the other thing when I'm hearing you talk through that journey I can then relate it back to your equation and I can see how at the base level putting the foundations in place is that credibility and competent but you will never get to the higher levels of being a transformer an influencer, you'll never get to these levels without clear motives and relationships and the way that you relate to other people. So, yeah, I can 100% see where you got with your journey. Yeah, and that's why that that mapping out that scoreboard that I talked about is so powerful. And again, because I'm the math nerd behind all of this, then I can tell that, you know, if, if you're on the manager level, then you need to be focused on building that credibility and that competence. But if you're somewhere in the uh, high achiever level or or maybe the transformer level relationship, and and that's what you got to be focused on. And so that's the beauty of that is that we can look at your, you know, your, your uh, level that you're on and we can know 
what elements of the leadership equation do you need to be mm. working? So let's go on to that in terms of improving leadership then. That's a good segue. So let's say that someone has come to you, Michael, come to your website or come to your organisation. They've been through the leadership calculator. They've come out the other end understanding a little bit more about themselves and hopefully they got their team involved, not just doing it themselves as we mentioned. They're understanding where they sit on the level one to level five levels of, uh, of leadership, what's next? What do they do next to then put something into action? Yeah, so it, it really depends on kind of where they land in the, the five levels and what their score is as to which of the four components that they really need to focus on first. I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can't focus on all four. Now, I do believe that you as a leader need to be doing some element that's going to, you know, doing some activities that are going to constantly be improving all four areas. But I think you've got to be intentional and focused on one at a time, right? And so, for instance, if I'm working with someone and we recognize that motive, motive is probably the one element of the equation that I believe is most misunderstood and in most questioned as to how, well, how do I improve that? Because again, sometimes I have leaders that are transparent enough to say, well, well, I'm in leadership just because I wanted the title. I wanted to be a vice president of so-and-so. And okay, I get that. I'm okay with that. But how do we, how do we change those motives? But then also how do we take the action necessary to demonstrate to your team that you have selfless motives, right? That you really have the best interests of the team at heart. And so we'll work with those clients and, and talk about uh, the actions that they need to be taking. And, and oftentimes it's related to appreciation, right? When, when we're talking about motives, I will usually start with how often do you express appreciation to your team members for doing a good job? And oftentimes they'll think through that and say, well, you know what? I don't really do that all that often. Well, those are actions that will prove to your team members, give them that perception that your motives are selfless and not selfish. If you're willing to take the time to recognize that they're doing something right or correct or above and beyond, and then you take the time to properly express appreciation to them, be specific about what they did and so forth and express your appreciation to them, those are actions that will improve your motive score of the equation, right? And so it really kind of depends on which of those four elements of the equation do we need to focus on. Um, but again, I kind of believe you should be moving the needle on all four, but we can really pinpoint for you which is the one that's really going to make the biggest difference for you if you start applying the right actions to it. And if they are going to make some transformative change in those areas, what do you recommend? Is it education? Is it coaching, mentoring? What's the best way for someone to move? Yeah, so we help our clients through a, a number of different ways to do this. We, um, we have courses. We have online courses where they can accelerate their leadership growth because what we do is we dive into each of those components and give them very specific step-by-step uh, kind of instructions on here's how you can improve your competence score, or here's how you can improve your leadership score, or I'm sorry, relationship score. Uh, we talk about what all that means and, and how to do that. But we also do it on an individual coaching basis, as well as we do it in uh, group, uh, group workshops and corporate leadership strategies. So uh, we, we partner with companies to become essentially their leadership development firm. And so we work with those, indiv those leadership individuals within that company on a long-term basis, year, multiple years at, at times, uh, because this is something, it takes time, right? You, you don't take one action. I should have said this earlier. One expression of appreciation is not going to move the needle all that much for you in terms of motive. But if you do that to, with multiple uh, team members, and you begin to do that on a consistent basis, then now you've really started moving the needle in, in motive. And so that's the reason that I believe, you know, long-term 
uh, you have to have a long-term strategy for leadership development. And we partner with companies as well as individuals to do that. Very good. And coming back to our point before that leadership can be improved. So you, this is something that you can address and you, to do so, it does require some kind of level of awareness of where you need to do the work. And then it requires action. It requires deliberate action. Uh, it doesn't just happen magically. It requires consistent action and purpose and meaning. So that's, that's excellent, Michael. Look, thank, thank you so much. That probably draws us to a close in our uh, interview today. I would like to finish up with our rapid fire round that we do with our guests. So I've got four sure. questions for you. Uh, the first right. one. Uh, what is your favorite book? Uh, boy, that's a that's a really difficult question, Mick, because I'm a prolific reader and there's lots of really qu- uh, great books that I love out there. Um, I, I think, uh, so I will restrict it to leadership books, right? And, and I think uh, probably right now, one of the most powerful um, leadership books that I've read recently is a book entitled Extreme Ownership. And it's uh, it's written by two, uh, two Navy SEALs. Um, and um, it, really, it comes down to what I was saying earlier. Uh, you always, as a leader, accept the blame. It doesn't matter at what level of your organization some fault was made. As the leader, you always accept the blame. So this idea of extreme ownership. And the book talks about the beauty in that is when you accept the ownership of whatever is at fault, now you have the power to control it or to change it. If you constantly say, well, that was just his fault. Well, now you've given up all ability to change that, to fix it, to make it better. But if you take as a leader, if you take the ownership of that, now you have the power to fix it and make it better. So the extreme ownership, uh, that's probably my favorite book right now. One of the things that I see a lot of there is the tendency to blame your predecessor instead of taking ownership of the cards that you dealt and making the most of the hand that you have. All right. So you're right, right. Ready. When you're bl- when you're blaming the guy that's already gone, mm. now you have no ability now to change that. Yeah, good. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Oh, again, gosh, so many good ones. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll keep it to leadership. And and honestly, I don't even know who to attribute this to. I've researched this uh, quote before, and and uh, there's not a good clean attribution of this, uh, who, who said this first. And in fact, some uh, actually attribute it to some, some verses in the Bible. But, uh, but my favorite leadership quote is this, if, if serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. Right? Mm. So if, you, if somehow you can't be a servant, well, then you can't be a leader. That's really nice. I'm going to remember that one. I'm going to put that up on the show notes for this one. That's a really nice quote. Thank you, Michael. Next question. What's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Oh, my goodness. Uh, It's hard for me to even remember 20 uh, at this stage. Um, But, you you know, I said it earlier. um, My earliest leadership lessons were in the Marine Corps. And when I was there, I thought it was all about rank and authority and position and title. Um, And it wasn't until after the fact that I could look back and recognize good leadership in the Marine Corps and and recognize the leadership lessons that I was learning. You mentioned Simon Sinek earlier. You probably know that he has a book entitled Leaders Eat Last. And he wrote that book after being with a group of Marines. And that is a principle that I learned in the Marine Corps, that, that the officers, the leaders, they eat last and they do so because that's an act of service, right? They, they want their team members to eat first. And so I just wish as a 20 year old, I wish I had been able to connect those dots and recognize the power of servant leadership and not attempted to lead out of rank or authority or, or, or title. Very good. And finally, Michael, I'm sure people in the audience are going to be intrigued by what we've been talking about today, particularly around the leadership equation and the leadership calculator, et cetera. If people want to get in contact with you or with credible leaders, how do they find you? Yeah, the the best place to go is uh, credibleleaders.com. Go to our website. 
It's really, really clear on uh, what next steps to take. You can easily utilize the leadership calculator that we talked about earlier, but I would start there, credibleleaders.com. And as far as social media, my uh, my most prolific uh, platform is LinkedIn. So, uh, you know, look for me there on LinkedIn. You'll, you'll find me and I'd love to connect with you there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today, Michael. I certainly got a lot out of today's episode and I'm sure that our audience will as well. So thank you so much for your time. We wish you the best of luck with your, with your business and with helping leaders to find themselves and their own leadership capabilities and help leaders develop other leaders. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Mick. It's a real honor uh, to have the opportunity to serve your audience. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixspears.com. I'm your host, Mick Spears. Sound design and editing by Faris Sadek. Social media by Gerald Calibo. And special thanks to our operations manager, Say Spears. We appreciate you and we appreciate your time today. You can catch the video podcast and our series of shorter videos by subscribing to the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at our Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you another great interview next week as we learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.